So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the course. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Yeah. All right. So I think I started the recording. Share the entire screen. Okay, so I think the screen should be visible now. Uh, so an announcement is, uh, yeah. So the assignment, the first assignment, has been released. So uh, you should be able to view it now. Uh, so okay. you will. Have Right. Okay. So you will have uh, two weeks, about two weeks, to submit the assignment. So there's a programming component and a theory component. So some of the programming for some of the programming parts, you will also have to write some answers, right? Like things like Taylor series approximation and all that. So, so anyway, uh, all the instructions have been given in the assignment itself. Uh, so yeah. So I hope. You guys have started going through, or you know, whenever you go through, like let us know if there are any questions or anything. Okay. So just to get a sense, the assignment is visible, right, for you guys? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So uh, let's uh, resume from where we stopped last time. So remember, we were looking at the necessary and sufficient necessary conditions basically last time. So uh, we discussed that you know for any optimization problem, which is where the objective function is differentiable, a necessary condition is that the gradient is zero at the optimum point. At the local minimum, the gradient is zero, and uh, but this is not a sufficient condition. So all these points, there are there could be many points which have gradient is zero, but they're still not optimal. Okay, so all the points which with gradient as zero are called the critical points. Okay, so we saw proof for why uh, this is this condition, this necessary condition is true. Okay, so it's just basically about the like you know whichever direction you go, you should get an improvement. So that's the idea. If it's a local minimum. Okay, and this is uh, a bit of calculus, and then you get the proof. Okay, so I hope uh, you guys had a chance to go back and look at the proof, and hope things are clear now. So, any concerns on this? Was it all clear, the proof? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But uh, let's keep this also open. Yeah, OK. So yeah, so then what we said is now uh, the first order conditions only makes use of the gradient. So uh, so this gives you a way to filter out, like, OK, like these are the candidate points where you could find uh, an optimum. Now, another condition like this is an additional thing, the second order necessary condition. So in addition to gradient being 0, you also have the second the, uh, the Hessian uh, at the point x star that has to be positive semi-definite. So this is positive semi-definite, OK, this notation. So this is an other condition. So to find an optimum, you can look for all the points where these two conditions are true, OK? So that's where we stopped. And we also saw the proof of uh, the second order necessary conditions. So that made use of Taylor series expansions. And uh, so basically, whenever you see something like this, this O of small o, so it just means that this term is very negligible. OK, so this uh, O of alpha square by alpha square. So this term is extremely small compared to alpha square. So you know you can actually you know, you know, ignore this term in some sense. So the reasoning that you saw last time uh, making use of the small O, so that was basically to support the fact that you know this becomes as very small. So this can be ignored, and that's why you have uh, the Hessian is positive semi-definite. Okay. So now today we will see uh, a sufficient condition. Okay. So it makes use of the Hessian information as well. So it's, it looks very similar to what you just saw before. So it's just that if 
the function is twice differentiable and you have a point x star with the gradient is zero. And now the Hessian, the second order uh, derivative, the Hessian at the point x star is positive definite. So note that this means positive uh, definite. So this is a matrix, right? So if this is positive definite, then you can be sure that x star is a local minimum. Okay. So uh, just it's a very small change. So if the other case, what we had is if x star is a local minimum, then this condition is true. The gradient is true. I mean, the gradient is zero. That part is true. And the Hessian is has to be positive semi-definite. Now, what you're saying is if the gradient is zero and the Hessian is positive definite, then you're sure that x star is a local minimum. Okay, so what this tells, this doesn't say that this is the only circumstances under which you have a local minimum. So it could be that, you know, there's some other conditions, uh, but it's not positive definite, but still x star is a local minimum. That can be there. But this is just one of the conditions where if you have this, you're sure that x star is a local minimum. Okay, so uh, we will just get to the proof, just the sketch of the proof, and uh, before we look at some examples. So, um, what we are given here is the Hessian at x star is positive definite. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, so, when the Hessian is positive definite, it means that all the uh, eigenvalues are positive, right? So, you have some lambda 1 and so on up to lambda n and these are all greater than zero so let me call it lambda min so that is the minimum eigenvalue and then you have a lambda max okay you have many eigenvalues in this range so these all are greater than zero that's what it means okay so now given this so this is what is given and uh, the claim is that uh, if this is true and you also are given that the gradient at fx star is zero okay now, using these things, we are going to prove that x star is a local minimum. Okay, so now uh, one fact from uh, you should know from your linear algebra days is that if lambda min is a minimum eigenvalue of uh, this matrix, so this is a real symmetric matrix, and uh, so it's diagonalizable. Okay, and it uses using this fact, you can show that the this matrix, right? Now, suppose you construct a matrix like uh, the Hessian itself minus lambda min i. So this will turns out that this is going to be positive semi-definite. Okay. So given a, a positive definite matrix, this one. Okay. Uh, and if you take the lambda min, the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix, then if you subtract out lambda min times i from this original positive definite matrix, the resulting matrix you're going to get is positive semi-definite. So this is something like you can uh, make, you can, you can prove this through eigen decompositions and all that. So I'm not going into the proof here. So you can refer to any of any standard linear algebra book for this. Okay. So uh, when you say that a matrix is positive semi-definite, what it means is that uh, we saw this, right? That you have for every y, for every vector, this quantity, right? Uh, y trans y transpose this matrix times y has to be greater than zero, greater or equal to zero. Okay, so that's just this condition, right? So uh, let me just write it here, maybe. Okay. So if if A is positive, if a matrix A is positive semi-definite, it means that for all X in Rn, so this is an N cross N matrix, right? So for all X in Rn, you are going to have X transpose AX is greater than zero. Okay, so I'm just using that fact here. So for any, so I'm just saying that for all vectors in Rn, I'm going to have this condition is true. So because of the positive semi-definiteness of this. So now, uh, making use of the, again, the Taylor series expansion, suppose you take any direction y around x star and you're trying to move. So you have x star here and you're trying to move in the direction y. Okay, so the new point you get here is x star plus y. Okay, so this is, uh, so like we are trying to see that, you know, how the uh, function value at x star plus y is compared to the function at x star. So that's what you have to show. Okay, uh, so fx star plus y 
and by making use of the Taylor series expansion around X star, you have this representation. Okay, and you have the small O term. So the intuitive idea is this term is very small. Now this term goes to zero <clears throat> because the gradient is zero. That's given to you. And uh, this term is going to be greater than zero, right? It's, uh, yeah, so this is going to be greater than zero. So in short, what you have is this difference, fx star plus y minus fx star, that is just going to be, this is going to be the dominating term. And that is going to be greater than zero always because uh, the Hessian is positive definite. So that's why this is going to be, fx star will be the minimum point. So that because this difference, fx star plus y minus f fx star, that you're going to get that as a greater than zero quantity always. So that's the uh, sketch. I mean, that's how you, um, that's the overall proof idea. Now it's just about some technicalities, right? So, so you have, so from the Taylor series expansion, this is what you got. And now rearranging the terms so that on the left hand side, you have this difference. And on the right hand side, you have this term. So now based on this uh, fact here that you know, uh, for every y, this quantity is going to be greater than y transpose y lambda min. So that's what comes here. So this quantity is going to be greater than lambda min times y square, I mean the norm y, norm y squares, because y transpose y is just the norm square. So this quantity is just norm y square. Okay. So then you will uh, get this term plus this O of y square, I mean norm y square. So now just doing a rearrangement, you take out norm y square out, you're going to get this. Okay. So here, uh, again, we know that, you know, uh, all these O notations are taken around where, um, around the zero point. So the norm y as it goes to zero, you're going to have this limit is zero. And this is by definition of small O. So uh, again, plugging in what small o really means, you have that for all epsilon, you have some delta so that <clears throat> if y is in you know less than some delta, this quantity here is going to be less than epsilon. Okay. So now, uh, yeah, this is just about some technicalities where you're going to say that this term is much smaller than lambda min by two. So actually, the reason is you know if this is always a positive quantity, it's fine. But if it becomes negative, then you want to show that this is going to be less than lambda min by two, so that this whole thing is greater than zero. Okay. So so then this so this uh, O notations that holds for every epsilon. So you in particular you can put epsilon as lambda min by two, and so then this term this uh, that's the same term that you have here that's going to be dominated by lambda min by two for all y within delta. <clears throat> okay, so it's it's that kind of completes the proof. So putting it all together, you're going to have this norm. This is greater than zero. Now this part is greater than zero from you know what we just showed. So in essence, what we have is fx star plus y minus fx star is greater than zero for every y within this condition. So for any small region you take around uh, x star, you are going to get an increase in the function value. So that shows that x star is a strict local min. Okay. So um, yeah, is this clear? Do uh, you have any questions on this? It's morning class. You're all quiet. Ma'am. No question. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, yeah. how did we get greater than zero? Like uh, I didn't follow there. Uh, Which, the second term goes to uh, uh, the small o term goes to zero. Hmm. Uh, yeah, this, yes. So now this term, this lambda min, you remember that this is this is going to be always greater than zero because we, uh, what was lambda min? This was the smallest eigenvalue of del of the Hessian, right? And the Hessian was given to be positive definite. So that's why all the eigenvalues are greater than zero. Okay, so that's why this term. Okay, so that's why this term is greater than zero. Okay. So that is that clear? Yes, ma'am, it's clear. Okay. 
So um, when I said that this goes to zero, yeah, that's the intuition for it. Like all these other, the rest of the details here is uh, like making things more precise. Okay, that's what I mean. Uh, but the intuitive feel is that all these are, I mean, these term, this term is very small. Okay. All right. So what about the others? Any questions? Is this clear? Yes, Sankar. Um, what we needed was that the no, uh, not the uh, the uh, what we needed was the mod of that term that is O of y square by y norm of y square yes. by uh, O of norm of y square by y square. Yes. That should be the mod of this should be less than lambda in by two, right? Uh, no. So what this means this when we write of something of this form, this means that this is. Uh, uh, it means it limit uh, some. I mean, so this is saying that you know, O of uh, norm y square. This is some function, g of y square. Okay. So this uh, quantity. So what this is saying is actually it's a function. I mean, it's some function g of y square by norm y square. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, this function g is actually O of norm y square. That's what it means. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, what so, I had doubt was that, uh, like in the in this uh, out of this line, mm -hmm. you have written that for uh, if the norm of y is less than delta, then mm -hmm. this relation this relation holds true. What we right. needed for the function uh, for uh, Hessian to be greater than zero, what we needed mm -hmm. was that the mod of O of norm of y square by y square should be less than lambda one by two. The yes. absolute value, the magnitude, right? Yes, yes. But we haven't proved that, right? So that Can is like true. Is no, no. So that is true. Like in particular, if you take this epsilon as lambda min by two, then what you're going to get is this quantity is going to be less than lambda min by two. You specifically plug in this value of epsilon as lambda min by two. And this value can be negative, right? But in it, yeah, yeah, it. So yeah, so what happens is the claim is this is true for any epsilon you take, right? So uh, mm -hmm. so so because of that, like you take epsilon as point one, then this is going to be less than point one. If you take epsilon as point zero one, then also this is going. To, you'll find some range. You'll find some delta, such that this quantity is going to be less than point zero one. So for any epsilon you take, you're going to get this quantity is going to be less than epsilon. Yes, ma'am. But it can be like it is. It is minus two. Okay. That is also less than point one, right? Minus two is also less than point one. Okay. If that is the case, then what mm -hmm. I am saying is that what we have proved is that lambda one by two uh, mm -hmm. is greater than small o of uh, small o of norm mm -hmm. of phi square by norm of phi square. So if lambda min by two is zero point one, yes, then the, this value that is small o of norm of y square by y square can be minus mm -hmm. two. That also holds true here. Yeah, that can be true. Yeah, if that is the case, then this quantity yes. that is lambda min by two plus o of small o of norm of y square by y square, this will be yes. minus zero point one, minus zero point one, zero point one nine. Yeah, sure, one sure, sure. Sure, hmm. but that's anyway. It's going to be something which is greater than zero, right? No, ma'am. It's not greater than zero, right? Well, you said lambda min is point zero one. Huh. Uh, and uh, this quantity you're getting is minus point two or something. Minus two. Mi minus two. Minus okay. two. Hmm. Okay. So now, when you take this difference, what are you going to get? You're going to get a negative quantity. But that is yes, greater than oh, okay. So that's what you're saying. So, okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, but I think uh, the idea is that it is the absolute value of it, right? So that is has to be less than epsilon. It is right? the absolute so that, value, then, right? Yes, yes, it's the absolute value exactly. Okay, ma'am, that's fine. Okay, so yeah, so, yeah. Thanks, Ankit, for pointing that out.
yeah so it has to be the absolute value so that is so actually yeah that's true from the definition of o, small o right okay so uh, yeah so these are some of the technicalities for saying that this is a small quantity but anyway so uh, the idea is if you have these conditions that the hessian is positive definite and the gradient is zero you have this uh, f of x star is a local min so this is going to be greater than zero always okay so any any other questions on this it's clear to you all yes ma'am okay rohit says it's clear what about the others yes kushal says yes what about others lakshmi said that yes the share said yes okay okay all right okay what about lakshmi are you here uh, ma'am uh, i think i'll have to go through the proof uh, myself once okay um, so any particular step which is unclear to you No, ma'am. I want to do it myself. I thought. Uh, okay, sure. No, it's clear. Sure. Okay, sure. All right. So uh, feel free to ask if something is unclear. Okay. All right. So uh, now let's just go through an example. So you saw it's been about uh, theorems and proofs. So let's just take an example. So suppose you have this function. Okay. So two x one square plus x two squared. Minus two x one x two plus two x one cube plus x one power four. Okay, so I want to find all the uh, optimal solutions, op all the local optima for this problem. Okay, so how we, would you go about? So the first thing is you have the first order necessary conditions, and you want to find all the x such that grad f x grad f x is zero. Okay, so you want to find all these points. So these are the critical points. So you want to find all of them. Okay, so let's. So, what's the gradient? Can someone tell me? So it's gonna. It's two-dimensional, right? F is from R two to R. So you're going to have the gradient is gonna have two components. So can you tell me the partial derivative with respect to x one? Four x one minus two x two plus plus six x one plus four x one. Six x one. Six x one square plus four x one cube. Four x one cube. So that's with respect to x one. Now with respect to x two. Two x two minus two x one. Two x two minus two x one. Okay. Yeah. So the what you need to do first is set this is this is as this is equal to zero. So this is the zero vector. So then, what do you get? So from the second equation, you have that x two should be equal to x one. So that is one uh, condition. And now you need to look at the first one. So what you have is four x one cube minus two x two plus six x one square plus four x one cube is zero. So if I simplify this a little bit, what am I? So x two is actually x one itself. so i can uh, just write this as x1 okay so because we already know this has to be true so what you're going to get is i can take uh, to x1 out and if i simplify this i'm going to get 2 x1 square minus 1 plus 3 and uh, 3 x1 right plus 2 x1 square again is this right so we have yes ma'am pardon ma'am the first term is 4x1 instead of 4x1 oh, x1. okay okay thanks for yeah so right so this is actually going to be 2 this is just 2x1 so you're going to have just one here right so this is 2x1 okay thanks for pointing this out so this is equal to 0 Okay, so now from here you have uh, you need to find out the roots of this. 
So here this, again, you can simplify, right? So this is going to be just 1 plus 2x1 plus x1 plus 2x1 squared. So what you're going to get is 1 plus 2x1 times this plus x, x1 times 1 plus 2x1. Okay, so what you're, overall you're going to get is 2x1 times 1 plus 2x1 uh, times uh, 1 plus x1 is 0. Okay, so now here you have three possible conditions. So either x1 is 0 or x1 is minus half or x1 is minus 1. Right, so remember now we also had x2 is x1. So x2, so the points are either 0, 0, minus half, minus half, and minus 1, minus 1. So these are the critical points. And these, and you, the idea is like some of them could be, one or more of them could be the local optimum point. OK, so now you need to do something more here. Uh, so it, matrix can someone tell me so you should verify that these the gradient is actually zero at these points so that's a cross check but uh, okay so hessian you can tell me some someone can tell me so what you do is first you take this term take the derivative with respect to x1 okay so this is going to be a matrix okay so the, this is going to be uh, the derivative with respect to x1 of the first part of the gradient. So can you tell me that? 4 plus 12x1 plus 12x1. 12x1. Uh, x1 square. OK, say that again. 4, 4 plus 12x1 plus 12x1 square. Plus 12x1 square. OK. This and OK, so that is this part with respect to x1. Now, with respect to x2, what do you get minus for this two. term? Minus 2. Minus 2. Two. Minus 2, right. Now, you take this second term and uh, take the derivative with respect to x1 first. Minus so that's two. going to give you, again, minus 2. And then 2. And here, 2. 2, two right? OK. So yeah. So just, you know, when you compute the Hessian, like, Remember, it's a symmetric matrix, so that's also something you should just you know cross check. Okay, so now what you have is you have these three critical points, right? So you evaluate what the Hessian turns out at each of these points. Okay, so let us take at x equals zero zero. So at that point, what you get the Hessian if you just plug in these values of x here, you're going to get four minus two. 2 and minus 2, right? So is this positive definite, or is it positive semi-definite, or it's none of it? How, um, any answers for that? So how do you check that? So one, remember, we looked at some of these conditions, right? The Sylvester's criterion, which says that all the leading principal minors are greater than 0 for positive definiteness. So for uh, positive definite, all uh, leading principal minors are greater than 0. OK, so what does it mean? You take the first term here. So this is obtained by the first row, first column, only uh, that entry. So that's 4, and that's going to be greater than 0. <clears throat> now, if you take the first two rows and the first two columns. OK, that's the second leading principal minor. So determinant of that. So that actually turns out to be determinant of this matrix. So that's going to be what? What's the determinant here? Two. So determinant is uh, four. 8 minus 4, right? 8 minus 4, that is 4. So this is greater than 0. And uh, also, the other entry is 4, the first entry, this one. So that is also greater than 0. So all the leading principal minors are greater than 0. So you have that this matrix is therefore it is positive definite. 
Okay, so uh, remember we just saw the second order sufficiency condition, which said that the gradient, if the gradient is zero, and you have the Hessian is positive definite at a point, then it's a local minimum. So this point zero zero is a local minimum. Okay, so zero zero is a local minimum. Okay, so now let's we had some more critical points here. So let's take minus half minus half. So at x equals minus half minus half, what do you get? The Hessian, what does it boil down to? So this was the Hessian, right? So all these other terms are just minus 2, minus 2, 2. OK. So what is this term, the first term? 4 here? minus 6 minus 3, uh, minus 2. 4 minus uh, 6. 6 minus 3. Okay, four plus minus three, six. Plus three, plus three, plus three, one. One, one. So four plus six, four minus six plus three, is it? Twelve by four. So yeah, right. So this is just one. Okay. So so what about this? Is this uh, positive definite? No, ma'am. No. So why is it not positive definite? One is greater than zero, but the determinant of the whole matrix, that is uh, two minus four minus two. Yeah, so the determinant is 2, minus 4, so it's minus 2. And this is less than 0. and But this part is greater than 0. So this is not positive uh, definite. OK, so so this is not a local optimum point. OK, so this actually, I will just show you in some time the contours. So it actually turns out to be a saddle point. OK, so this is a saddle point. OK. So now let us see what about this one more term, right? At x equals, I think it was minus 1, minus 1. Okay. Sorry. So, OK, so what is the Hessian here? So again, you have these terms are constants anyway. So what, what do you get here? It's, Four. 4 and direct, 4 minus 12 plus 12. So it's just 4. So this one also, yeah, it is positive definite. So it's the same thing that we had here. Okay, yeah. So this is, right, so this is also positive definite. So uh, so this point is also a local optimum. Okay, so this is an example of a case where, you know, the optimization problem has multiple local optimum. So 0, 0 and minus 1, minus 1 are the local optimum, local minimum, actually. OK, so uh, just to cross check it, let's see what uh, we get if we are going to plot this. So this is in two dimensions. So it's OK, we can plot it. So I've just written the code already. OK, so first let us just uh, see the contours. OK, so I'm just taking the range minus 2 to 1. Because after all, the range we wanted is it should uh, we want zero minus one and minus half, so um, yeah, so it discovers that. So let's just see what happens in that range. Okay. So and also maybe just plot the surface. Right? So so. Okay. So actually, if you just look at this, so this is the uh, sorry, this is the first dimension. So how do you interpret it? This is the one dimension x one. This is x two, and this third axis is the function value. Okay. So is this visible to you all the plot? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, you know you can actually play around with this, just move it around to visualize and such things you can do. So here, if you see, it looks like there are two optimum, right? So the shape is something of this form. Okay. So uh, yeah, of course, many things are not like immediately clear, but this is just an intuition you get on the visual. So here, it seems like you know if you just move it around, there are two points of optimum. It appears. OK, so uh, these are exactly what we found, the 0, 0, and the minus 1, minus 1. OK, so we'll just see the contours also. So, 
So I've just taken some points here and explicitly mentioned at which points I want to see the contour. But um, yeah, this comes by, you know, you can just start off without any uh, specifying any values and then you want to zoom in and check what happens in the region around, you know, for example, like uh, at zero, zero, I know that the function value is zero, right? So I just wanted to make it like very small, the function values and see what happens here. So here, if you see, like these seem to be like, you know, here all the function values are 10, 5, 3. So it's gradually decreasing. And when you come to somewhere here, okay, so there are two regions where you have 0 0.0625. And I also plotted 0 0.005. So it's come as a very small point here. So perhaps these are the regions where you should probably look at, okay, for... Uh, having the gradient as zero, the critical points. So now you can also see the gradient. OK, so just do this. OK, so if I just explicitly plot the gradient also. So here, this is a plot which is showing you the gradients. So everywhere else, it's showing some finite values and some direction here. But at these points, it seems like very negligible. Okay, The gradient, there is hardly any. So perhaps these are the regions where the gradient is becoming 0. So you have this region here, right? So this was a minus 1, minus 1. And we also had a 0, 0, so somewhere around here. And then we had a minus half, minus half also. So somewhere even in this points, you don't see any gradient being shown. So that's possibly also a critical point. Okay. So now if you, so from here, it's not clear. Is it a local? So it, it could be that maybe all these areas, are they local optima or what? Okay. So, um, so then you can even zoom in. Okay. So now here I've shown this part, right, where you have minus. So I want to see around the region minus one, one. OK, so one of the points was minus 1, 1. So I want to see a region around that. So I've just taken these values. So now I'm just going to plot the contour here. OK, so here you see it's a very regular contour. So around this, it's some point zero six two five, then point zero one, And uh, it seems like you know it's, it has a bold shape. OK, so that, again, you can see from plotting the surface plot around. It's a small, it's like I'm zooming into the function. So here you can see that it's it seems like it's just one minimum is here. Okay. So now let's just see one more thing around the minus half, minus half range. Okay. So. Okay. So you see, it's just showing some kind of a crisscross. Okay, so it seems like you know around all these points, the function value is remaining the same in all this region, and uh, this is kind of indicative of a saddle point. So now, if you see the surface, okay, so you, you have to just play around with it a little bit. So if you just move it a little bit, you can see this kind of a region, right? The surface. Uh, yeah, so it seems like, you know, it, uh, there's a Plato kind of thing, and then there's a decrease and a decrease on that side. And it's also increasing in this region. Okay, so this is what is a saddle point, exactly. And that is around the minus half, minus half. Okay, so this, somewhere in this part. Okay, so, uh, so that's something like optimization aids to understand the function, so that couple of things, right? So if you see, if you plot the function, you understand something more about, you know, where you can find an optimum and things like that. But sometimes when things are not very clear, even these necessary and sufficient conditions also give you some other idea. So it's kind of the joint uh, confluence of both these that really helps to make, uh, you know, to understand these functions better. Okay. So uh, yeah, your assignment will also have some uh, questions along contour and these kind of plots. So ensure that you get comfortable with these tools. Okay. So any questions so far? No ma'am. Okay. Rohit is clear. 
Okay, so I think things are clear so far. So now um, I just want to also come back to an application that we had started discussing in the last part, last time. So I'd mentioned about this linear regression application where you will have these unconstrained optimization problems. So let's just see, like, you know, if we apply these in the context of linear regression, or it's also called the least squares problem. So what happens? Okay. So recall that we had a matrix A, and uh, you know you also are given these values B, and the problem was to find this kind of a solution which minimizes the least squares uh, objective. Okay, so this is actually called a least squares objective, and you want to find this x which minimizes it. So suppose uh, if B lies in the column space of A, then this is going to give you a value zero. OK, because you can exactly solve this problem. But many a time, like that's what happens in linear regression because of the noise terms that arise, um, you will not exactly have uh, B in the column space of A. OK, so then um, you at best you want to find an X such that this difference is minimized. OK, so this is an unconstrained pro problem. And let's just begin by assuming that the columns of A are independent. Okay, so uh, yeah, what happens then? What what is the optimal solution of this? Okay, so uh, yeah, why is this assumption important if the columns are independent? So it turns out that you know if they are not independent, so if there is some dependency in the columns, so the columns of A look like something like this, and these are all. Uh, uh, dependent say there is at least one column which you can write it as a linear combination of the others and now you're trying to find x1 to xn right so uh, remember that when you multiply this you're going to get x1 times first column plus x2 times the second column and so on okay so if one of them is a linear combination of the others what you could do is you could just eliminate this xn variable right and uh, you know you could accordingly adjust the values of x1 and so on to get back the same uh, product okay so that's why you know it, you're trying to ensure that there is really no redundancy so that's why you want the columns of a to be independent okay so uh, yeah you could remove this and yeah just completely do away with this column to get back the same um, the same product Okay, so now let's again apply this whole thing, right? So the function is ax minus b, the norm of this square. So this is actually just ax minus b transpose ax minus b. So if you if you expand this, what you're going to get is this term. So x transpose a transpose a. So that's the first one, uh, minus x transpose a transpose b minus this plus b transpose b. So this is just um, algebra, OK? It's just multiplying vectors and matrices. So you should verify that you know, this, you're convinced that this is what you'll get, OK? So later, maybe go back and you verify. And uh, so this, uh, this becomes the final form. So f of x is just x transpose a transpose ax minus uh, a product, I mean, a term which depends on x and a constant, OK? So now what do you do? You set the gradient to 0, OK? So that's what the first order necessary condition tells you. So now this is, uh, yeah, so this is again in the space of matrices. Remember, these are all, uh, so this is a vector, OK? x is a vector, and so you have to take the gradient with respect to x. So it's actually the same things that we did. Like you remember in the example just before, we took a gradient with respect to x1, x2. So it's the same thing that you have to do in this case also. But just that things are written in terms of matrix products. OK, so uh, yeah, these are some things which help you. So if you have to take a gradient of this term, this quadratic term, what you're going to get is a transpose a x star two times this. OK, so uh, this is something that you can actually, you know, expand out the matrices A and, you know, take this product and just see for yourself that that's what you get. OK, um, so that's uh, so. Yeah, so if you take the gradient, you, this term is going to give you 2A transpose A X star. And this is going to give you 2A transpose B. OK, so everything which doesn't have the X. So are you guys, have, are you comfortable with this kind of... Uh, derivatives taken with 
you know, matrix products and things like that. Have you done this kind of uh, calculations before? Um, uh, you haven't done it. OK. So what about the others? Have you done it in some other course? No. No. OK. So uh, it's so maybe like later on, you can just go back and you know expand these terms. So you just take one of these terms at a time. OK, so just take some example A and you know just uh, write out the whole function. So this is going to give you this whole thing is going to give you one number. So uh, you take its derivative and see what you get. And then you also just take this uh, directly and you see what you get. So that's just to do a sanity check that that's indeed what you get. OK, so yeah. So yeah, so now uh, give this, these are the equations you need to solve. OK, so this so that's going to give you just a transpose a x star is a transpose b. Now you need to solve this to find x star. OK, so. Um, one way is, you know, first you check if A transpose A is invertible. So if it is invertible, what you can just do is you just stay, say X star is A transpose A inverse A transpose B. Okay. So, uh, but to, to be able to do that, you need to be sure that A transpose A is invertible. So when is a matrix invertible? Right. So from your linear algebra time, you should know that a matrix is invertible if its null space has only the zero vector. OK, so if it is full rank, so that's kind of saying that, right, like the matrix is full rank and uh, or another way to say it is that the null space has only the zero vector. So this is coming as a consequence of the rank nullity theorem. OK, so uh, is that true? So is the null space what? What, what about the null space of A transpose A? Does it have anything other than the zero vector? So that's the check we will do. So let's do this, right? So suppose x lies in the null space of A transpose A. So what it just means is A transpose A times x is the zero vector. OK, so this is a vector. So A is R m cross n. So A transpose A is just going to give you an n cross n matrix. OK, so. Uh, yeah, so, so this product is going to give you the zero vector in n dimensions. Now, so this is a vector itself. So this is a vector in n dimensions, in n dimensions. OK, so now if you take that vector and uh, take the dot product with x again, so still you're going to get 0, because it's, this is, was a zero vector. You took a dot product with some other vector. You will still get zero vector. But this term is just nothing but, so this is Ax exactly. OK, so it's the Ax transpose of Ax is what this term is. OK, and this is going to give you 0. OK, so Ax transpose Ax is 0. Okay? Now, uh, this is actually, you know, this is a single vector, and this is the same vector. So this, it's the, you know, dot product of a vector with itself. And that is just the norm, OK? So that's what we write as a norm. And this is 0. And if you remember, a norm takes a value 0 if and only if every element of this uh, component, every component of this vector should take a 0 value. OK? So so yeah, the norm is 0 if and only if uh, every element is 0. So that's why you should have that every element of Ax is 0. OK? So what we have shown is we started off with a vector which lies in the null space of A transpose A. OK, and then we showed that if it lies in the null space of A transpose A, it also lies in the null space of A. OK, so this is true. Okay. So now, uh, what does it mean? So remember, uh, AX is 0. So does it mean X is 0 or you know, what is it? So we also showed that the columns of A are linearly independent. OK, so now you have a set of columns, which are a set of vectors, which are independent and a linear combination of them giving you 0. So then the only way that can happen is x has to be 0. OK, so that is remember, if you remember, the condition of linearly independence is just that any combination of linear 
uh, any linear combination of these vectors, if it gives you zero, it has to be that you know that co coefficients which multiply it have to be zero. There's no other way. Okay. So again, what we have shown is so the only vector uh, x that satisfies x is zero is x is zero n. Now remember, we st this x was the same x which was in the null space of A transpose A. Okay, and we showed that it lies in the null space of A. And now we showed that the only way, uh, only thing in the null space of A is zero. Okay, so what we have in essence shown that if a vector x lies in the null space of A transpose A, then it has to be zero. There's the only z zero is the only vector which lies in this. So you have that A transpose A is invertible. Okay, and uh, so then you know you can just write this as a transpose a inverse times a transpose p okay so yeah so this is a candidate local optimal okay now the second order conditions are also what you need to verify that to show that indeed it is a local optimum and it's not a saddle point okay so uh, is this step clear like how we uh, wrote this equations like how we wrote the expansion for x step. It's not clear. Uh, Ma'am, I had a doubt in one of the steps. Yes. Um, can you scroll up? Uh, uh, there in x transpose a transpose ax minus 2 x transpose a transpose b. So mm -hmm. the previous step, it was x transpose a transpose b minus b mm -hmm. transpose ax so how right. like how are they how, yeah two? yeah so actually these are um yeah so these are just some numbers right so this is a single number and this is also a single number okay so um so actually like you know if you take the transpose of this vector so this yes ma'am it's the order, transpose of that yeah, it's just the transpose of that, but these are just some numbers. So when you take the transpose, it's you're just getting back that number itself. There's no change in the dimensions or anything. Okay, so that's why these two are actually the same quantity. Okay, so that's why it gets combined to minus two times this. Okay, okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, so these are some uh, operations, this matrix vector operations and you know, taking the derivative and you know, so these are some things you have to slowly get comfortable with it. So you, you can just practice these out. Okay, just expand these and see, you know, just but you have to verify that these two indeed give you the same quantity. Okay. So any other questions? They're all quiet. What's happening? We'll tr I'll try the, the proof at home and then I'll get back to you with if I have any questions. Okay, so the regression one, is it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I mean, I understood what you were saying, but uh, I mean, I'll have to reread the proof again. Okay, yeah. Sure. What about the others? Shubham? Shubham, you're there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Shubham decided to just not answer. Okay, so uh, anyway, you guys should go back and, you know, just go through the steps again. If there are some questions, again, you know, we can come back and discuss it next time. Okay, so yeah, so this is just to give you a feel of where you use these unconstrained optimization and, you know, some initial ideas on how to solve it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm done now. I think we don't have time. So, let me stop here and we'll again resume on Thursday. Okay, so thank you all for coming and have a good day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma yes, Tushar. Uh, I had one question regarding the assignment. Uh, okay. Actually, we are using Jupyter notebook. So okay. can we submit those files? Yeah, you can submit the Jupyter notebook files. That should be okay. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah.